Good evening, everyone. We're so glad that you are tuning in to this series on some very important things that Jesus said while he was on the cross. Last week, we looked at the first statement Jesus made, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus said in the Gospels that if we have seen him, then we have seen the Father in heaven. So when Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, we see how God's desire is to forgive us of our sins if we turn to him. When we hear Jesus speak to the thief on the cross next to him, we see how much God desires to have us with him. That is what makes these next words that Jesus spoke on the cross so upsetting. And that's what we'll be focusing on this week. It says in the scriptures, at about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That word forsaken means abandoned or deserted. So you could read this like, God, why have you abandoned me? What we have to realize is that Jesus is not confused about what's happening, and he's not having doubts, and it's not like he was not expecting this. However, the pain of God turning his back on his son after a human lifetime of favor and communion was simply too much to bear. Now, this message tonight is not about hopelessness. This message is about substitution. It's about how Jesus knowingly and willingly put himself on a cross to be forsaken so that we did not have to. He became our substitute. If we look back before the cross, we see that Jesus knew exactly what was going to come and he willingly went to the cross for us. Here's what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest and trial. It says, going a little further, he, Jesus, fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for the cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. After seeing the weakness in his most faithful disciples, he came to terms and prayed, If it is not possible unless I go through with this, then I will drink the cup. Jesus is talking metaphorically here, but what he is really talking about doing is taking all of our sin and putting it on himself. Jesus had never sinned, or else he would have been in the same bad position we are all in. Because he is sinless, he could make the choice to take the punishment for us. Now, you may be asking, isn't God loving? Couldn't God just forgive the sins and not make Jesus go to the cross to die? Yes, God is loving, but he is also just. God is both love and justice. We see in 1 John that God is love. That means a God entirely comprised of love judges sin. Then that means his love demands judgment. Think of it this way. If a murderer was in your house and you caught him walking into your brother or sister's room, your love for your sibling would demand that you make a judgment and a decision to punish that which threatens your family. That is what sin is to God, a destructive force that destroys our soul, and he is not having that. If we choose to identify ourselves with sin more than we choose to identify ourselves with a loving God, then we are caught up in that judgment. Jesus took the bullet by standing in front of us, and he took God's wrath fully upon himself. He was forsaken so that we did not have to be. It's not Jesus that the Father had forsaken. It was the sin that Jesus became for our sake. Paul sums it up in Jesus' sacrifice in the book of Romans, where he was explaining this to the Gentiles in the largest city of that time. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. And the craziest part of all this is Jesus could have pulled the God card, and he chose not to. He chose to be our substitute on the cross. He didn't dodge the bullet, he jumped in front of the bullet, and that is why he gets the victory. Paul continues to explain what this means for us now that Jesus has paid the price for our sins. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also share his new life. We are sure of this because Christ rose from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. 
He died once to defeat sin, and now he lives for the glory of God. When we choose to follow Jesus, we choose to die to our old selves. We choose to move away from our old life of sin and to live a new life that centers on following Jesus. By claiming Christ as the sacrifice for our sins, we get to claim his victory over our sin and death as our own victory. That was God's plan all along. We get to live free because Jesus went to the tomb. But Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Both Paul and Peter quote a psalm of King David when they told others about God's plan to resurrect Jesus. You will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. In the psalm, David states confidently that God would not leave him in the grave. Now, many of us fear death because we cannot control it or understand it. As Christians, though, we can be confident that God will not forget us when we die. He will bring us to life again, to live with him forever, because Jesus has defeated death. Paul writes again about how we can find security knowing that God will not let us stay in the tomb. It says in 1 Corinthians, When our earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die, then at last the scriptures will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory, and death will be mocked. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, sin, where is your sting? How we thank God, who gives us victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. And again, Paul says in Romans, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And even more, a little later in that chapter, Who does the devil think he is trying to still condemn us? Christ Jesus, who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now, all of these verses point to one truth that is so important for us to understand, that Jesus loves us so much that he would willingly die for us. Jesus could not stand by and do nothing as we let sin destroy us. He stepped in and took our punishment upon himself so that we could live free from sin. So remember, as we close out for today, Jesus was not saying, why have you forsaken me out of what he was feeling? But it was because Jesus literally became sin. Because of that, God had to turn his back on Jesus because he will not have community with sin. God is holy. That said, both the Father and Jesus knew that this was temporary because once sin was buried with Jesus, the Father would once again turn back to communion with Jesus and bring him back from the grave. And as Christians, when we believe that Jesus is our Savior, the one who took on our sin so that we could be set free to live the life that God has called us to, we can be assured that God will do the very same thing for us when our lives here on earth come to an end. We get to live free because Jesus went to the tomb. We have a hope and a future thanks to the risen Jesus.